talking a lot about AI now, but we're not talking not enough about that emotional intelligence. That emotional intelligence comes to your character of who you are. We don't focus enough on that. You know, society in general doesn't. We're looking at ac academics. We're, we're so fixated on those types of grades. We are terrified of placing pressure on kids at home and in school. If you look at participation medals, it's something I completely disagree with. I think that it's damaging. We shouldn't be scared of, of saying, guys, you know, you did well, but weren't at the same level as, as X. And those that are focusing on developing their human skills are going to be more valuable than those who have, that, who have got the hard skills. Mm. The best way to develop... I've just come back from an incredible podcast episode interview with Monty Mavellian, who is the founder of Overlord Academy here in the UAE. Uh, we're good friends and we've been talking for a long time about character development. Uh, we both have the same purpose and vision with our companies here in the UAE to help inspire young people to develop their character. We do it through martial arts and Monty does it through outdoor leadership and adventure activities. Uh, we work together closely through our two companies, but to bring this episode to you and really talk about some of the biggest challenges that parents face within character development, the biggest challenges that the educational system faces when it comes to the development of soft skills or emotional intelligence, how we can develop leadership skills in young people and why that's so important, I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. Monty has such vast experience when it comes to leadership development. At the age of 23, he was looking after 30 soldiers on the front line. He's got an amazing background in the corporate life and the professional life as well. And he brings all that together with his Overlord Academy. So you're going to be hearing more about Overlord Academy through the Warrior Academy and the work we do together. And that starts here with this fantastic episode. I hope you enjoy it. So welcome, Monty, to the Warrior Academy podcast. Um, we've had lots of chats, and every single time we've talked, I felt like we might as well just record it because um, all the parents that follow you in Dubai and the work you do with Overall Academy and all the parents that you know, follow us with the Warrior Academy, I feel would really enjoy some of the insights from the conversations we have. So um, yeah, here we are filming the, uh, the podcast uh, for the first time. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, Seb. And uh, yeah, I've really been looking forward to having this chat today. So yeah, can't wait to get stuck in. So um, as we always start, we always start with just kind of getting to know you a little bit better. Tell me a bit about life growing up. Uh, Monty as a child. Tell me the story. Okay, Monty as a child. Um, Monty was is, is not my actual name. I got that wrong. Uh, yeah. Swati, we've, uh, <laughs> we've got that wrong. <laughs> it's a nickname of mine um, that has stuck with me for, for many years. Um, uh, and, and you know, you'll probably know because you come from a military background with your father. But um, a lot of the things that we do in the military, sometimes they come with a, a bit of banter and fun, and, and and that was something that stuck with me. So um, Monty was a name came in the army. Long story stuck with me ever since. I was actually born um, on my passport as John, uh, Christian family lived in Sussex, um, I uh, West Sussex, in fact, um, a place called Chichester where I grew up. And yeah, that's where sort of life started for me. Um, very, very much, uh, it was really into my sort of outdoor pursuits, loved being outside. I was lucky enough to live in the beautiful countryside around the South Downs National Park, which was just amazing. So I camped and cycled and ran over the, the hills there many times. Um, life progressed. I went to an ordinary sort of state school uh, in the UK. Um, uh, I, you know, was okay with my studies. Like I wasn't amazing, but I was, I was good enough. I had a, I had a real passion to, to try and do something different. I didn't want to go straight into the corporate world. So I went in and had a real, um, passion and drive to join the army. Um, not that my family like yours came from necessarily a, a long history of military background, but, um, my grandfather was in, and I just had a real passion. I had a real passion for the forces. And that's where my life started to really shape. And that's all I ever wanted to do. So I, I um, yeah, looked into joining, um, joined up, went to uh, Sandhurst. Well, that was around 2006, which I don't know if you know, which is the military training academy for officers. I was lucky enough to actually spend time um, training alongside the royals at the time. So Prince Harry and William were there, which was a fascinating sight and, and a real privilege to train with them. And then commissioned um, a year later after that course, and then and then carried on my army career. So, 
went in to um, serve with the Royal Engineers and as a combat engineer, and then um, subsequently went on to do the, the um, pre-parachute selection course, which is one of the, the hardest selection courses in, in the Army, which allowed me to jump out of planes, which is always fun, and I know that you're a massive fan of that as well. And then, um, and then uh, you know, life changed a bit more. It was a very, 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 very strict, uh, sorry, uh, t well, the tempo was high in terms of military operations at the time. We were involved a lot in uh, at, the mo at that particular point in Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan. Um, so at the age of 23, I was in charge of a group of around 35 soldiers um, and was leading them on combat operations in Afghanistan in 2008. Um, which was a, a, a you know, life-changing experience. Um, left then, uh, came back, did a couple of things on public duties in, in London, guarding the Queen, um, then left the army. Then came out, did a few things in terms of um, uh, you know, corporate stuff and corporate world stuff, and then um, moved to Dubai about seven years ago. And here I am now, and working with the Overlord Academy where we're we're teaching young children about character development, resilience, leadership, and teamwork. Amazing! What a what a history there. There's so much to um, to dig into, right? Because I don't think looking back, you can kind of jot out the dots and see why people do what they do. Obviously, outdoor leadership, adventure activities have been a huge part of your life. But it sounds like most of your your adult life. Did you do a lot of that when you were younger as well? So sort of you know the the kind of the earlier years, you know, seven to fourteen or so. Yeah, I think. The, the younger years um, was definitely it was sport related to start with. So that leadership where you, you, know, you gain a lot of experience, where you think that is, and I think this is important to stress, is that you think you're gaining leadership experience on the sports field. Um, that's where a lot of people try and develop it. And, and naturally you get some leaders that will come across and, and will actually you know, shine on the sports pitch, but you'll also get a lot of others that don't. And um, you know, I do think and I strongly believe that leaders are not born. I think they are made. And that is where a lot of the time, I don't feel like right now, a lot of people are training people to lead. I think that people are training people to manage quite effectively, but there is a distinct difference between leadership and management. So when I was young, being on the sports pitch was great. Um, naturally, I was quite an extroverted person, which which helps. But that doesn't mean that you can be you don't have, you can't be a good leader not being a, by being an introvert. And then I think that the bit that really changed me was then I started to do things where I wanted to to join the cadets, and that that was something that I did when I was young. So, for those that don't know, you have the scouts, which is again a very big name that people know about. But you also have the cadets, which was a program um, developed in the 19th century, well, years, years ago. And it was basically around developing leadership and resilience in children to avoid situations when uh, the enemy would try and invade the UK. Now, whether that was the French back in the day or whether it was preparing for the Second World War and all those sorts of occasions, it was about preparing the youth to be resilient and strong enough to be able to adapt to a situation that might come. And, and thankfully it never did. So the French didn't invade us and neither did the Germans, although they tried. So those were the, that was the reason why it was set up and it's been going ever since. So it's been in schools, it's, it's massive in schools. And, and I suppose being a part of that and doing that was, was a real step change in how I started to become um, or develop my leadership and uh, as a young child and, and had an interest in it. So although I have been doing it from a, you know, although I have been doing it more as, as I've been older now, I think it, it stems and, and it's really important to come for when you're younger in, in your youth. Uh, and that's where I think we need to do more of it. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating really when you, when you kind of look at the impact, some of these older versions of scouts and, you know, why why they actually exist in the first place but a lot of the a lot of the morals and the, the kind of traditional values and you know the, the true purpose of that still holds true today whether or not it's protecting the country for future invasion which is probably unlikely but the reality is that re that level of resilience is so important to ingrain in young people and i think actually even more so as their lives get easier in a lot of ways you know from the outlook and um, we internalize things differently and suddenly things like depression creep, you know, creeps up, you know, cases of that increase. And so it's, you start looking at it like, well, if life gets easier, 
do we need to put more of a focus on building resilience? Because otherwise we interpret things around us as, you know, um, worse or, you know, more impactful than our own lives. So I think um, I, I've always looked at things like the Scouts as very, very aligned with what we do at the Warrior Academy. You know, when I, when I look back at my childhood, I look at the things I did like 10 tours, right? When I was 14 and had to carry a 30, 40, 40 kilogram bag for 45 miles across Dartmoor and the, the training kind of leading up to that and how much that grew us as individuals, you know, a team of six to eight of us and the impact that had. And I look at character development and I always look at it like, it's the small things you do every single day, the daily habits, the way in which you've got a moral compass, a way in which you live, something to live for, you know, a, a, a dream shot, a purpose, something you're striving towards. But it's also taking those, those skills that you've learned and then testing them in the real world. Yeah. And uh, so often I've met some incredible martial artists. Um, you know, we're talking Olympic champions, world champions, European champions, whatever it is that we work with around the world. And they built up all this confidence in the dojo. And you, you know, you see them in the dojo and they're incredible. You see them in a, in a competition situation and they're incredible. But you take them outside of their comfort zone and put them into something brand new and they're completely shaken. You know, their confidence drops massively. And so it's one thing to, to you know, train someone in the same thing every single week where you can, you know, you can kind of nurture them in that bubble. But you have to, if you really want to develop character, you have to move people out of their familiar environment into a foreign environment where it's a bit of a shock, right? And this is what, you know, I noticed doing, doing martial arts throughout my life and then being taken on these adventures around the world. Uh, Ten Tours is one of the first examples, cycling across the Sahara Desert and the, the base jumping and skydiving, that sort of stuff, right? It's, it's all very much character building, but it's big one-off events. Mm -hmm. And can you, can you recall any big one-off events as a young person? The one-off events, yeah. Um, you know, I think the first thing I'd like to say on what, you know, your the character development is is such an important thing that I think we're not we're not doing. And I know we might touch on this a bit later, but so I don't I, hope so, yeah. I don't want to hijack your question. I'd like I'd like to I'd like to. <laughs> um, but you know, I think what you're doing in terms of, you know, you're highlighting that in the in your academy is great. And I the reason why I'm so passionate about it is because that I don't think that, you know, we don't focus enough on that. You know, society in general doesn't. And, and, and it's the same in businesses, okay? I've worked, when I, when I left the military, that, that is all, the military was all about character development, okay? It was all, not developing us as a character, but developing us mainly emotionally on how to interact with people and how to have the emotional intelligence of how to like, you know, um, inspire people to do things that they don't want to do. You know, we're talking a lot about AI now, but we're not talking not enough about that emotional intelligence. That emotional intelligence comes to your character of who you are. And, you know, you can throw people in and people can wave a flag and say, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing character development. But, you, you know, if you're not actually developing that, the character in someone, then, you know, you're going to set, they're, they're, they're not set up for life later. Mm. So I, I know we'll go into that and I'm sure we'll go into that more, but that is really, really, really important, and uh, and the businesses that I that I've seen as well and been a part of, you know, Simon. I just Simon Sinek once said that you probably you yeah. know he's, he's great, and he said he once spoke to um, a, a bunch of Navy SEALs, and I don't know if you've seen this clip, and he said, you know, um, what makes your organization great? What makes your organization a really high performing team? And um, what the guys, the Navy SEALs at the time, they said, well, you know, we all want someone who is high performance and high trust. Yeah. So I yeah. was talking about the quadrant. The quadrant yeah, yeah. The yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I, I love it. And that high performance, high trust, you know, is where, you know, you want your person. Then he, then he, then he said, you know, we, what no one wants is that low performer, low trust on the bottom right, you know, quadrant side of the, of the box. And what you know, he goes on to say, mainly for your listeners who haven't seen it, is that there are so many KPIs in the business world who will try, that will try to, you know, really um, support and benefit those high performers based on KPIs, hitting sales, conversion, but not enough on the trust element. And that's where the character comes into it. And, you know, and I think it's great when he says, you know, anyone in the room, you know, you can spot who the 
you know, the, I can't swear on the podcast, you know, the, 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 the rude, the, the person who is not so great in your team, who is that um, over there? Uh, yeah, you can all spot that person because everyone will point to the same person. And that fundamentally comes down to the character of an individual mm. because they're not seen as trustworthy. And there's so much more we should be doing around it. I think uh, tr trust is such a massive thing, isn't it? And, and uh, you know, we often get asked a lot, how do you make a child confident? How do you bring that out of them? And um, it's, it's interesting to me because it all stems back to trust. And the, the best way to develop confidence in anyone is to teach them to trust themselves. What, what is confidence? It's your trust in your ability to perform or execute. Ultimately, that's what confidence is, right? And so the greatest way to build that trust is to become a reliable person for yourself. So ultimately, if you say you're gonna do something, you do it. The second you don't do it, you damage that trust. Yeah. And one of the things we say in the War Academy is we always say 4% more. And by that, we're, we're basically slipping in a confidence hack, which is rather than just doing what you're expected of, you know, or what you promise yourself, go one step further. So you're always overachieving based on what you set yourself. And other people see that too. And I think when you, when you look at it, we'll talk about society as well and how things have changed when it comes to that. Um, one, of the, one of the fascinating things there is I feel like people's word doesn't matter as much anymore. People will say something and they'll flake last minute. You know, they'll, they'll say they're going to go out to dinner and then they'll last minute they'll say, oh, something came up. Or, and people um, have this very kind of laissez-faire approach to the things they've promised. And I'm kind of the opposite to that. And maybe, you know, my wife might watch this and be like, no, oh, it's a real pain that he's, that he's like that because if he says he's going to do it, even if, even if it's <laughs> tricky for everyone around him, it's going to get done. But, the, the, you know, I think the ultimate um, benefit of that is you show the people around you you're trustworthy and you know, subconsciously, you're always watching your behavior. And I think if you start breaking those small promises to yourself, yeah. that you, you develop a, a pattern kind of neurologically, you watch yourself do this yeah. and your confidence shoots down. And so I think that's, that's kind of a, a newly ingrained, you know, negative trait that society's got. Yeah. Is that something you've seen as well? Yeah, yeah, I 100% I, I agree. I 100% agree. And it all starts with you know, trusting yourself and 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 there and it goes from there. I, I I couldn't agree more with that. I mean the going back to your your previous point around like what was there a key thing in in you know in my childhood or in that in that that you know really wanted to or that shaped or it was a like challenge. A, like a one-off event. One off event or something. Yeah. Yeah, I pretty much did similar things to you. Yeah. You know, Duke of Edinburgh award schemes that we did and in schools. I know Duke of Edinburgh, the international award out here is still, you know, fairly, you know, well known. Um, but it was big, you know, in the UK. So that was about just getting rough, ready, dirty, you know, living in whatever extreme environment, knowing how to use a map and compass, mm. getting out in the to the hills, surviving on your own. You know, that 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 is what life was about for me at that time, that age. Yeah, you know, that was so running up all my Duke of Edinburgh awards, I was so passionate, did from bronze to gold, loved it. You know, they were great things, ten tours, doing yeah. stuff like that, you know, night navigation exercises in the in the in the hills um, with my mates. You know, we weren't just looking at a screens on a, on an evening. So just to jump in there, yeah. why why did you want to do these things? What was it that that made you want to, you know, spend your weekends yeah. cold, wet, is it in the dirt? Yeah, is it? it's, it's, it's actually, it's a good question, isn't it? And I still want to do it on these on my weekends. Do you, do you think there's something just inside some people that just wants them to go outside and experience nature and just get in it? You know, I think there is, right? And and I, honestly, I still want to be doing that now. So my ca my character in the... You should have done this outside, really. Yeah, exactly. In the 45 degree heat. heat. Different well, conditions. That would have tested our resilience, <laughs> wouldn't it? A one-off event. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, for, 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 for me, like it, there wasn't, I just had, the, I, I was surrounded by like-minded people who wanted to do that. Yeah. I, I felt like, I felt more, just, I just felt more alive when I was doing it. I felt more like um, connected. I, although I didn't realize it at that, that young age, I think now looking back at it, I would have done. But I just loved just being out in nature. You're like, it was just really powerful. Was there any encouragement for your family or parents or peers or was, or was it mostly coming from you? No, I mean, there was, there, look, there was encouragement in the, in the respect of you know, go out there and, and do what you mm. want to do, right? Try and achieve things, but not to the point where I was pressured. And I think that's also something that, um, you know, sometimes we can get a little bit wrong. When we're looking at academia, we're looking at ac academics, we're, we're so fixated on those types of grades and the pressure that these poor young people, my two children that I have, I have a 10 year old and a seven year old, 
you know, I want them to work hard and have a good work ethic, but I don't want them to feel pressured into the respect that they feel like, you know, they're going to be forced into a, you know, or go down a depressive route or, you know, because that's not what life's mm. about, you know, I, I, and I've been on this planet now for almost 40 years and learned many, you know, lessons, although I've still got many more lessons to go and, and learn as well. But that's one thing I have taken away that I didn't feel pressured by my parents to do really anything. They were encouraging in the fact that they wanted me to achieve good things, but you know, I didn't feel like I'd disappoint them. Mm. And, um, so, you know, I didn't really necessarily get, um, yeah, any sort of like, uh, you know, guidance from them to go out more. I suppose we didn't have so many things to take our yeah. attention away. There were less screens, right? So you kind of, we didn't have any. What are your options? Well, yeah. outside yeah. this, outside for that. Come in when the uh, vanilla lights go on. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we we were happy growing up, and I'm not saying that nowadays. I mean, I look at my seven year old, and he's he's fixated on the screen. Yeah, you know, he he's still my son, but he still loves the screen, and I think there is a but there's a balance that we as parents are going to have to play in that. So we're going to have to realize that. Because, con you know, subconsciously for a child, they will be enjoying themselves and connect it and won't realize that that is not the best thing for them to be doing mm -hmm. long term. So we have to consciously be aware of it ourselves as parents to then guide them and say, OK, great. You know, we've got you've got some time on the screen. We can't take that away from you. You know, we're growing up in this digital era that we need to be a part of. And I've always said that, you know, anyone who doesn't isn't a part of it is going to get left behind completely. So, you, you know, embrace it. You've got to balance it. Right? But balance. It. Yeah. I, I think there's a there's a great conversation around pressure there. I think pressure's got a bad rep. I think that we are terrified of placing pressure on kids at home and in school. And I think that we are, especially in the educational system, doing our best to protect kids from failure. It's like whatever it takes, yes. we can't let the students experience failure. Even the word failure, we've got a negative relationship with the word failure. And in the Warwick Academy, we call it earning your losses. Mm. You know, so uh, a great example of how we protect kids from failure is participation medals. If you look at um, if you look at participation medals, it's something I completely disagree with. I think that yeah. it's damaging. When you look at when you look at life and you look at giving someone something they haven't earned, it does more damage than good. If you look at people who, who won the lottery, right? So many people who win the lottery. They've not earned that money. So they win the lottery and then it negatively influences their behavior, yeah. their actions and their decisions. They end up damaging the relationships around them, losing most of it, sometimes even more because they develop new behavior patterns which then damage them later in life. And so that's one example. If you look at people who got a promotion where they didn't really earn it, they just fell into it. They, you know, they'll, they'll kind of squander that opportunity. They don't really know how to react and they, they, you know, they make negative decisions yeah. all the time. If you look at children who get participation medals, you know, ultimately what you're doing is saying you're going to win anyway. And so what that does is it, it lowers their intrinsic motivation and it raises their level of entitlement. And it's, it's so fascinating for me to watch this just unfold everywhere around us. And so at the Warrior Academy, we're making a stand on this and saying we don't believe in participation models. Yeah. Courage should be rewarded. So if you go to our competitions, the kids get a T-shirt which says Summer Samurai or they go to the Winter Warrior, Winter Warrior and so on. So they, they get rewarded for their courage, but it's not a medal medals and trophies and things like this should be reserved for people who work exceedingly hard and get to the very top of their class or group whatever it is yeah and i think when we do that we reinforce the you've got to work hard to achieve and we don't lower what achieving actually means and um, which you know you're nodding away and this, this is why i want to do this podcast because you know we agree on pretty yeah there's a, there's a lot of things <laughs> we agree on right and i think you know, that is that is a, uh, is another topic that I'm, I'm I'm completely in agreement with. You know, and that, that's the thing, right? So where we, when I say you know we don't want to put I don't want to feel like my children are being pressured mm. at school, you know, um, academically necessarily. That's that doesn't mean it's that forcing down a route against their values yeah. or what they actually want to do. Yeah, right. But, and and then also they they should they should understand that they have to work hard. Yeah. So there's not that's not saying don't worry, you know, if your grades aren't great or don't worry this, just, just come and, you know, just do whatever, be whatever, whoever you want to be, and life's going to be fine. No. Work like the right things. Exactly. Not the things that someone else wants us to do. Exactly. And do your best, right? Mm. That's, that fundamentally comes down to just do your best. And that's one thing that the scouts do really well. They mm. have this thing called, you know, did, 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 do your best, do your best, which is another thing that Bear Grylls talks about because it really is true, right? That's about just do what you can do, do your best. But when, you know, when we, um, when we look at things like now nowadays clubs and i look at my my children as well who go in and they get participation medal you know it gets pulled in it gets shown to me dad i won this and it gets thrown on the floor 
And it's a case of there's a stack of certificates and medals that are just not appreciated in any yeah. way. Yeah, and, and you know the failure thing you have is great. We also have it in the in in the Overlord Academy where we have part of our creed, our cadet creed almost is I am not afraid of failure because mm -hmm. failure is the first step to success. And and it really is. Okay, so you I've been through many failures in my life, and I'm sure you have as well, and 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 a lot of listeners will as well. So but we shouldn't be scared. We shouldn't be scared of of saying, guys, you know, you did well, you know, but you know, you didn't well, you did do well enough, or weren't at the same level as as X. Therefore, you're not going to get um, an award. And you know, you know, we have had people say to us before, well, why didn't everyone get an award? And yeah. you know, we've been quite clear and said, I'm sorry, but not everyone will get an award. Yeah. And you know, we have to make those. That, that, that cool now. Here's, here's the difficult thing though. So, so we've got a, a headmaster coming on in a couple of weeks. Um, and I know that in that school, they have, they do give participation medals. And so we're going to have a chat about this as well. And my belief is that a lot of the pressure comes from the parents. It's not actually the school saying this is what we should do because this is the most important thing for the child. It's kind of the school, it feels like the school is saying we're worried what the parents might say or do if we don't do it, right? Um, there's enormous pressure put on teachers and you know, I've got teachers in my family and there's, you know, I've got so much respect for teachers because they put, they, they, you know, they, they put so much of themselves into, into looking after their kids. And one of the things you spoke about was um, pressure on academics. I mean, you look at the role of a teacher, you know, I look at my, my sister, for instance, she's a primary school teacher in the UK and, you know, working loads of hours, loads of pressure. At the end of the year, Ofsted comes in, wh whoever it is, and says, you know, this is the academic score of, of your year for your students. You as a teacher have passed or failed, right? And it's, you know, I'm summing this up in a very basic way, but ultimately it's, it's like they are measured on the academic success of their students, but they're not measured on how they've been the pastoral care for the child whose uh, mum has passed away or parents have divorced or they've had to, you know, whatever it is, move house last minute, or do you know what I mean? All these different yeah. things that come up. They've, they've not, they're not measuring the emotional care or the emotional support that a teacher passes on. All they're looking at then is the academic results. And so for me, there's, there's all that pressure, which is kind of top down on academic results. Uh, when really, when you, when you spoke about AI and the development there, that for me says we need to focus even more Yes, everyone needs to learn that, but even more on what makes us different, which is what makes us human, which is emotional intelligence and soft skills. And what are soft skills? I, I think soft skills are just hard skills, which are difficult to measure. Do you know what I mean? And so, and so you know, the Warrior Academy, we've really worked hard over the last decade to develop a system for actually measuring soft skills and measuring character development, and then systematically increasing what we call the three C's, competence, conduct, concentration. You know, a child will get a score 30% for confidence and we'll be like, right, can we increase this to 50% over the next six months? Let's work on that. And I think having a measurement for soft skills is massively important, but, it, but even so, it's just having that as a core focus. Schools don't have that as a core focus. You know, I think they're, they're learning to and more and more are, um, but I'd, I'd like to see, you know, my, my kids walk into school and it's like, today we're learning about bullying. Today we're learning about failure. Today we're learning about resilience. Today we're learning about how to overcome adversity. You know, all this sort of stuff. And then maths and English and science and stuff, you know, it's all, it's all important, but it's that balance, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really hard thing to balance. And I think you're right about that. Teachers are under a lot of pressure. They're under a lot of pressure because they get pressured from the academic system that is trying to grade them. Then they get the pressure from parents, understandably who want the best for their children. And then you know they have the pressure of delivering the job on on uh, as well on the day-to-day -day side of things. So I I completely understand that. I think you're right. You know that is an area where you know um, it's tough. It's tough for them. I do think you know schools can do more, um, and I agree with you. And that character side of it is is really needs to come across more. And that's why I say to, I mentioned earlier about that in business as well it's the same with education right so mm. you're measuring right now which is a fantastic thing you're measuring you're making a system to measure the character through a character type of uh, measurement that you have in the, in the warrior academy which doesn't exist right now and it goes back to business we don't reward people for being that trustworthy mm. person you know we don't reward people for caring about you know your colleagues it's are you hitting your sales targets yeah. yeah and it's the same thing and that's what society is breeding 
I do think that what I have seen um, recently is that people are trying to embrace it a bit more, mm -hmm. like as schools are. I, I've noticed that. Um, the reason why I say this is, I, I you know, the school that my daughter goes to, she's they have a, a character compass as well, like a character compass. It's all very well saying those things, but you've also got to live and breathe it. Okay, and that's the bit where I feel like it can be a tick in the box exercise. We're doing it. We're not actually actually doing something about it. But I do think that that school, you know, is, and I think that there's an element there where, for example, my daughter at the end uh, of the last academic year, she was awarded, um, which I'm really, really proud about, was awarded the Character Award, you know, and that was an actual award mm. that came in that came into place. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know there was an award for that. You yeah. know, that's amazing. That's that is, that's that's there. At least you're re you know you're representing. And actually, she didn't get maybe best student, but she got best in terms of character and 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 you know how she interacts with her peers and for me i was like that is a really amazing mm -hmm. award i want so yeah i i 100 percent agree with you that there is so much more that needs to be done and we should be doing more and i think again similar to like the warrior academy with the overlord academy the cadets get that experience with us as well so they try and they feel like maybe they're not getting some of that you know, uh, development necessary in schools, so they come and we 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 have a great time learning it as well. And it's the same with leadership, mm. right? You, you you know you you can teach leadership, and if you look in schools, you know, mentioning schools now, let's say your son or daughter is awarded the prefect award or is awarded a sports captain. Suddenly, that child is asked to perform yeah. an element of leadership and you know uh, something they have never they ever have to done step up into this new role and they have to step into this new role it's not being taught do you know what it, it's, it's interesting because um so often we get parents coming to us saying my child's got you know bad behavior or, or worse they say i've got a naughty child right the child's standing right there they're like my child's naughty and um i totally understand the parents frustrated but they'll go to school and the, this, often the teachers say the same thing so if you imagine a you know a 10 year old boy or a nine year old boy or, as an example uh, who spent the last six years being told by his parents in the school that he's badly behaved or naughty. And let's assume that a high percentage of these students have ADHD and really what seems like destructive behavior is just them needing more, you know. The reality there is that that's a reinforced mindset then. So they're being coached by their environment that they are a naughty person. So they grow into that role. When really, what I say to my team all the time and to parents as well is, you know, we inspire through language. Whatever we say about a child, they grow into. You know, whatever, you know, when you, when you speak to a child, you're literally painting a picture of what they'll become. So if you say your child's naughty, guess what? They're going to be naughty. Uh, the words carry so much power, so much meaning. And so one of the things I do, which relates exactly to what you said, if I've got a child who's been exhibiting, dis you know, disruptive behavior, and I kind of like disruptive behavior because when we're older, you know, we kind of seek that um, in the workplace. It's like, we want disruption. We want to try and challenge the status quo and evolve. Um, but when they're, when they're children, we say disruptive behavior, you know, bad anyway that's kind of another conversation but what i do with these young people is like give them responsibility straight away so i remember one example we had a we had a young boy um it was actually in a school and he came in he was you know misbehaving straight away looking for things he could do wrong to upset me or uh, the other kids or whatever it was right and that was just his the role he was playing he wasn't a bad boy it was just the role he was playing that he had grown into so immediately i i saw that he was you know Basically, what we in the, in the UK, we would call it the class clown, right? Yeah. So I came over to him and I had a word with him. I said, look, if you look around, everyone's, everyone's looking at you. You are a very influential person in the class. I think you'd be a fantastic leader. And his face was like, what? And so, you know, I said to him, would you mind being my assistant instructor for the class? So he comes to the front of the class and everyone's looking at him like, what's he going to do? Is he going to be silly? And you know, his, his role was to make sure the lines were lined up properly and there were 30 kids in the class at that time. Uh, all the lines were lined up, but he had to run up and down, make sure the belts were tied up, all this sort of stuff. He grew into this leadership role. And I think if you really want to improve conduct, which is one of the C's, one of the three C's that we focus on, you have to give responsibility. When you give responsibility, they grow into that role, right? And so I think, yeah. And I think the thing is that you were also a leader by recognizing that. Mm. So. What you did is you looked at your, let's say they were your team and whether they were your students or not, you looked at a problem and the solution came to mind, which was how am I going to develop and use that person into the best of their ability 
to not disrupt the classroom and to whatever else it may be. But that is what the lead does, right? So the leader of a team, whether it's in the military or not, we were always taught you're that guidance, you're that person who doesn't just take an algorithm or a process and say, this isn't working. It's about you having the emotional intelligence to go, right, well, hang on, what's going on with this situation in front of me? How can I best develop that person? And how can I then impact the whole class in, in the same way? And so you're you're using that leadership skill to to understand it. And I think it goes again back to your point, which is like AI is the biggest topic right now. You know, mm. AI and coding and you know, all of those things that that we are trying to develop in hard skills for our kids and the development of them going forward is something that they that we are encouraging, schools are encouraging, and understandably we should, right? Again, I don't want people to think that it's stop once you stop going back to the old days. <laughs> You know, like, no, no, we should. But if I asked um, a, a military leadership uh, specialist at Sandhurst right now, the Royal Military Acad Academy Sandhurst, and I was to ask them, and I have asked them, I said, how has leadership changed or evolved over the years, especially as we go into the, you know, into the digital era? They said, well, actually, fundamentally, leadership in itself is a human endeavor and will, hasn't changed and won't change mm. um, as much as we think. So I was like, well, so what can you explain more about that? And uh, they said, well, the thing is, is, this world that we're living in now will become more and more digital and more and more technologically advanced. But because most of the population and most of children society right now are focusing on the hard skills, those that focus on developing their soft skills and those that focusing on developing their human skills are going to be more valuable than those who have that, who have got the hard skills. Mm. Because as a hard skills coder or whoever else you are academically, you're gonna be able to do a job, right? But what you're not gonna be able to do is you're not going to be able to read the room, read the other coders, understand the, 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 the morale in a team, how to evolve it, grow the business into the next level, you know, really connect with individuals. And once that person comes in and says, okay, well, I sort of get and understand the coding side and I get that bit, but now I'm going to come in and add a layer of emotional intelligence and soft skills, mm. then that person is going to be seen as more valuable in the future and will fly through their career. So the point I'm making is that, yes, don't forget the hard stuff. Um, and it's not the right words to be using soft skills for this type of thing. But, you know, we'd, you know, I can quite frankly say we're not doing enough about it. Yeah. There might be people that disagree, but... I can see that we don't do enough about it. And I think you're uniquely placed to say that as well. If you look at your history, you've got the military background, you've got the corporate life. So you've seen a lot of, you know, how young people grow up and then how they behave as managers and leaders and what that actually looks like in the, in the professional world. And then you've got the Overlord Academy where you work with hundreds of young children, right? And you can see how that all kind of fits together. So I think you're, you're definitely uniquely um, placed to, to give a, a strong point of view on that. I hope so. And I, you know, and I think it's more, you know, I know that I'm no necess not necessarily a specialist and I understand that, you know, I, but I, I have a view on what I see and, and, I, and I can see it. And, and, and again, you know, it's, it's going back again to business. Like if you, if someone gets a promotion and then is, in, is, in, is asked to then go and lead a team, you know, I have seen so many, seen so many leaders, mm. potential leaders, who are not displaying any leadership skills. They're not ready for it the first They're place. They're not ready for it. A lot, of, a lot of promotions happen because people were in the right place at the right time and because they needed someone to fill the gap. Well, they've been there for long enough. It's kind of a, a virtuous um, reason for being promoted. I've been here the longest, therefore I should be promoted, rather than a, I'm the best person for the job. And, and I think that that's very dangerous because often I see managers or business owners even who are kind of in this position of leadership and they have control of other people's lives to a degree, right? They can change the course of someone, you know, the direction of someone's life. And often that's quite negative. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's providing that leadership development before they kind of need it. Yeah. To find the right people yeah. for the job. And, you know, and some people say to me, they go, they say, well, okay, Monty, we're fine. Well, what's leadership to you? You know, what, how, mm. what does it, what does that mean? You're like, okay, you're trying to say that there's a difference between management and leadership, but aren't they fundamentally the same sort of thing? And, mm. you know, okay, well, how can you take some of that stuff from the military and then, you know, try and put it in the business world if you think you're so much of an expert on it? And I don't, I'm just trying to, I've been through both. I've been through the military system and I've also gone through the corporate system. 
Now, when I look, when I try and answer that question in my own head and I think about it. Management and leadership. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, what, what is leadership, you know, to you and why does it make, why is it different, you know, sort of compared to what we're trying to do in, let's say, the business in the corporate world? I, I, always, I always look back and I go back to the, I mean, you know, your dad was an officer, right? <laughs> he was at Sandhurst as well. And he'll, he'll remember that, that, that there's, a, there's a motto that you, you read as you walk through that door and it says, serve to lead. Mm. And I mean, the first question I get asked, uh, you know, I well, was asked as a, 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 by my commanding officer when I was having my interview with them is they said, so come on, Monty, what do you think serve to lead means? And I said, um, you know, I was quite confident. I was like, well, I know, of course I know what that means. Mm. It's uh, serving your country, you know? Um, and they're like, uh, yeah, no. He said, well, actually, there's an element of that. But no, that's not what it is, you know? And then I said, okay, well, oh, it's not serving my country. Okay, um, it's serving the queen. Because at the time, I was serving under the queen. Um, it's serving the queen. No, you're wrong again. Although you are serving the queen, well done. You got a half a point. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. What, uh, serving my family, protecting my family. And he said, no. And he said, right, now... What you need to remember is something 100% fundamentally you need to never forget. If you commission and become an officer um, in charge of a variety of soldiers and a team, serve to lead means you're a servant to your soldiers. Mm. Serve to lead means that you will serve your team in every shape possible, every way. You will, if they need something in order to, in order to execute a task, you will serve them. There's no ego involved. Mm -hmm. There's no hierarchy unless, the, you know, in, in your head about, well, I'm the leader, I'm not doing that. There is a, is a clear cut point of view, which is I need the team to succeed and therefore I'm sacrificing as much of my own self in order for the team to succeed, which is supporting them in every single way. And when you look at that type of servant leadership, which is not just in, found in the military, it's again down to character. It's again down to soft skills, emotional intelligence, and how you connect with people. And when you look at it right now in the business world, it's very, very, very weak. Mm. Like that servant leadership for your team is hard to find. Is hard to find. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. without a doubt, it's the most powerful form of, of leadership, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and what is the difference between, you know, if you had to sum it up in one sentence, difference between management and leadership, what would you say? For me, it's uh, the ability to inspire a, a person to, to conduct an action, mm. not tell them what to do, right? So how you inspire someone to go forward and make and do something that they might not necessarily be willing to mm. do, that is leadership. And the big difference between having that inspiration and not is what? Well, the big difference is that one, you don't command any of the, of the respect from an individual. So if you are asking someone to tell you if you're asking someone to do something they don't want to do, mm. I'll take it, I'll, I'll draw it back down to some military examples and you can put it into business or the, like, like let's take a basic form of trench warfare, okay? I, right, you private Joe Blogs, I need you to step over that trench mm. and go and fight the enemy. And by the way, there's a risk that you're going to be killed in the process, mm -hmm. but I want you to do it anyway. Do you think someone as a manager is going to say that, um, who's a manager and who just generally tells you to do something, are they going to have a big impact or is a leader that says, okay, what's the why behind it? Right. Okay. Mm. Joe, this is the situation, you know, goes into the detail of getting into the head of this individual, why we're doing something, the course of action we're going to take, how as a leader, it might be that the leader jumps first. The leader is the one who would lead, lead from the front. So might go, okay, Joe, we're going over the top now, but, Back in the day, it was, you you know, might, might have been pointed to with a pistol. You had to go over the top. And that was the officer's job. Now what's happening in, in, in the modern way of leadership in terms of the modern army, sorry, is that leadership is, is a way of inspiring. So if uh, my officer runs over the top, blimey, I'm going to be following him. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. following that person who's doing an amazing job. And I wonder how many parents approach parenting through management or leadership? Good question, right? <laughs> I think uh, yeah. I think I think leadership is it's done through actions, right? And if you look at how a child looks up to their parents and grows, it's not just about you saying to do this or saying to that. They mirror what you do. And one of the best ways to teach a young person 
um, to live with a good character is to have a good character yourself, right? If you, if you focus on yourself and develop your own character and then you live that through the actions you take, the children that you've got follow that, they, they mirror that, right? And so I think that's kind of relieving for parents to know that actually, if you wanna be a good parent, you just gotta be a good person and you know, work on yourself and act as if you're a good person and you know, exhibit that through the, through the way in which you, you act every single day, the, you know, the daily habits, the, the big events, everything you do with moral conviction and through a moral compass. And I think, I think when you do that, you, you lead your children, right? And so yeah. you can't yeah. just send your kids to the overlord or send yeah. your kids to the War Academy and expect that's it. You know, it's, it's about leading by example at home as well as doing this thing. And I often see it as like, you know, we've spoken a lot about the educational system. We've spoken about how we want there to be more soft skills. But guess what? That might not change for many, many years. That might not be a focus for 10, 20, 30 years. So it's your responsibility as a parent to find, to find that in a vocational um, aspect as well, right? As well as doing it at home. So true leadership is understanding what's going on around you and then trying to make sure that you're steering the ship in the right direction through acting in a certain way yourself and inspiring the people around you to do that. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, like, um, <clears throat> this isn't a plug for both our organizations, but you're right that the fact is that you should look at what's missing, uh, find, do exactly what you did, right? So look at the situation in front of you with that student, understand how you're going to now evolve and develop that person to the best of their ability and use them in the right way. And that will be, like you say, looking at vocational uh, clubs, activities, events that will impact and develop them, um, as well as doing, obviously, the, the, the more traditional sports that you would find, but also, you know, like, like the stuff we're doing, and that also, again, in schools, um, understanding it, you know, being aware of it as well. Um, but I think, you know, uh, it, it, we're both parents as well, yeah? And um, parenting is just so hard. It's so hard because you always try to do your best and you're always trying to work out ways where, you know, I know I can be more of a role model in this respect and, you know, I can talk this till the cow, talk about this till the cows come home mm. on a podcast, but... Yeah, am I actually f actually doing it with my children at home? And Just a quick shout out to the guys at Shield who manage this podcast, come up with the strategy behind the podcast, help me schedule interviews as well as do all of the editing and the producing of the podcast. Without them, we wouldn't be able to produce this podcast. If you would like to create your own podcast, I can't recommend the Shield team enough. They have done well over 100 episodes for me over the last few years, and I've been so pleased with the results. So have a look in the description of this video or the podcast episode, and you'll see how to get in touch with them yourself. I think ultimately, you're, you're, you know, we're not born with a guidebook. And no. this is one of the things I always say as well is, we're not born with a guidebook. We're kind of all learning on the job based on our previous experiences, what we've seen as parenting from our parents, and then what we've you know, kind of learned and studied over the years and then experienced having our own children. So ultimately, I would say most parents are kind of winging it with the best, within the best of their ability. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, but isn't it funny that the first team your child's a part of is the family unit. The first leader that they have is the mum or the dad, right, or both. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's like you have to develop that team. And so one of the ways I look at, you know, my family is how can we all serve the family? in the best way possible. And that even the kids, right? What can the kids do to kind of help contribute or serve the family, even as young as three, right? My, my son, his way of serving the family is every day, he looks around the house for shoes and parks them up. And that's the one thing he does every day, right? And um, he takes pride in that. It's amazing, we've been doing it for a few weeks and every day he'll run around the house, look for shoes, even if they're not really meant to be in that place, right? And I come downstairs and the shoes are all lined <laughs> up and my daughter every day, she's cleaning the, cleaning the table after every meal. and. You know, it's, they've taken full responsibility over that. And then, um, you know, I've got certain roles in the family, so is my wife and so are my kids, and everyone's got their own contribution to serve the community. And I think that's a healthy way of kind of building in that, that kind of approach of servant leadership from a young age, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. You know, if you think about it and you look at, you know, your own family makeup, you know, whether you, you know, whatever part of the family you are, but as a parent, you know, both of you, you are, you're leading that family, mm -hmm. you know, you had, you, you have to lead that family. And, um, yeah. And it's, it's amazing when you break it down like that and you yeah. think about it, but again, we haven't been taught how to do that. No, you know, we haven't been taught how to do that. No, 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 yeah. But if you could, if you could understand like, again, the conversations you have with your children, again, that has got to come down to some form of emotional connection in order to try and get them to do things. And, mm. you know, you have to work on that, that humans, that human skills.
you've got, you've got, got to give that. a reason why. Like, yeah. why put the shoes away? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's the reason for that? Oh, well, have you ever walked in the house that is dirty everywhere? Yeah, I've done that. Oh, well, that's not very nice, is it? No, so how can we fix that? By doing this. Yeah. That's why that's important. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. Yeah. classic leadership. Give a, give a, tie the action to a deeper purpose, a bigger, a bigger meaning. Um, let's talk about Overlord and how the Warrior Academy and Overlord are going to work together. Um, first of all, just for everyone listening, give me like a rough, Give, give them a kind of about it. Give, give them a rough kind of breakdown of what Overlord Academy does here in Dubai. Yeah. So what we basically do is we um, we work with a variety of schools in in Dubai and we offer a program, a cadet uh, program. So as I mentioned earlier, there's things that you have like the scouts, um, but there's also the cadets in the UK, especially, but also big in the US and also Australia and New Zealand that are big parts of schools which are they understand that 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 type of training yeah, enables and develops a, a person's emotional intelligence and soft skills and contributes well to the curriculum as well. Um, so it's a fun club um, for six to 16 year olds. They get to go on adventures, work with uh, our team of ex British military instructors, whether it's from the army, Navy or RAF, a, a variety of uh, guys and girls with lots of experience. And we get to, you know, train, um, our cadets in in great life skills um survival skills uh again linking with character and i think the other thing is that we we try and make it experiential learning but also we put it into scenarios so one of the things you you you've mentioned is that you know yes you can talk about this and you can develop skills in young people but then how do you test it and and one thing that we do in the cadets is we simulate experiences and when we go back to our training in the in the military in the army especially with me like what i found was is that you train for bad nasty situations throughout your whole career and you hope that you don't go through them um although sometimes you want to go through them because you've trained in that respect but you go through the motions where it becomes muscle memory and therefore your training has to be really 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 good it has to be realistic. It has to be put put you know people under pressure, um, and you then get to see the the human aspects of an individual, how they react, how they how they develop their confidence, how they work with the team member. So what we do is we create experiences that enable us to pressure or in a in a nice way put the pressure on them to actually develop their skills um, out in the outdoors, uh, and then then you get to see you know how people are developing. Mm. So it's a combination of things. Why is it called the Overlord Academy? Operation Overlord was the um, code name for the Normandy landings that happened uh, in the Second World War. And it was about bringing leadership, teamwork and resilience and everything that we are on about all together to achieve an objective. And it links with our um, ex-military background as well. So that's pretty much what we do uh, in Dubai. Yeah. So I absolutely love the work you guys do. I, I see all your stuff on social media and, you know, I can't wait for my kids to, to join. As soon as, what's the, what's the age? Six. Six. Is, they six. Okay. Now, so yeah. I, so I've, got a, stories, yeah. I've got a, a year or so and a couple of few years for my son and my, my daughter might actually be able to join soon. Um, so yeah, I can't wait for them to, to join. Um, I see so much value in the work you guys do. Uh, you know, I look at my past as a child and I think there was, there was, you know, martial arts was amazing. And then the big jumps were off, often, you know, in character were often with the outside outdoor leadership type of activities. And um, so I approached you and I said, look, we need to work together. And, you know, I think there's, there's so much benefit to having the kind of martial arts background and the, the daily habit routine, that moral compass and the way in which we develop character through the three C's with those big one-off events with Overlord. And so when I look at our program, you know, we've got junior syllabus up, you know, when you start a white belt up to kind of a green tag, green belt, then you've got blue, then you've got a um, senior syllabus, then advanced syllabus, then black belt syllabus, then the instructor's syllabus. And so one of the things we've been talking about is, well, what if we train students for half a year in the junior syllabus? And then to get to the senior syllabus, they had to do a transition event where, you know, the juniors were taken on a half day experience with Overlord, with your team to test their character in, you know, a completely different foreign environment. So that would be one transition, the same from senior to advanced and the same from advanced to, to black belt. And I, and I think when you create these one-off memorable events, you know, you, you, you do the full picture with character development, mm. um, which is what I'm really interested in. Mm. The other thing that I know we spoke about was, um, we have new instructors joining us all the time. Um, it's in our best interest to test their character. And so, um, you know, within that first kind of three to six month probation period, 
we would like to send our instructors to Overlord for a long weekend for you guys to work with them in developing young people outside of the dojo. Mm. I can see an instructor in here do an incredible class with years of teaching experience, you know, world champion, European champion, whatever it is. But I want to see what that instructor's like when they are tired, when they're hungry, and they're in the middle of the, you know, the, the cliffs in Rack or they're in the <laughs> desert in wherever, yeah. and how they manage a group of young people. And uh, I think, you know, getting that professional assessment from you guys would, would help us as well. So there's a million ways uh, that we could work together. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. And, you know, 2024, hopefully there's going to be lots of events. So, yeah, I, you know, we, we're excited too. And I think, you know, that, that's great that you're recognizing those sorts of things because like that, that is how, as I've just said, you know, you put people into situations where they're not necessarily used to or comfortable with. And then you can get a good assessment of what they're like. And so, you know, you might talk in the dojo about, you know, what does it mean to be a team and, and how and why and, and all those all those, you know, great things that you discuss alongside what you teach. But then, OK, let's put it to the test. Yeah, okay, let's see. Let's put a challenge. Up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to be removed from the four walls. You're going to go into an environment you're not necessarily sure about. And then we're going to start to see. And then there can be an element of, OK, great. Well, you did well and you've shown good signs and, uh, of great teamwork there or great leadership but what you can do is this you know and uh and develop yourself that way so it is it's a it's a it, and that's all we do it's a tool to you know we use things like the outdoors mother nature um which you know holds you know no prisoners and mm -hmm. and there's a case of just putting people into you know environments where they get tested yeah and you know we don't do that enough like yeah. camping resilience you know s sleeping out of the rough and we, a bit we, want, we want to protect young people from ever experience uncomfortability. Yeah, uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, be a, look at this conversation we've just had, right? Yeah. It's like failure is good. Be uncomfortable is good. Yeah. Pressure is good. Yeah. You know, it and really so, is. and this is, this is two guys who work with thousands of young people every yeah. single week. Yeah. You know, if we're seeing these problems and we're talking about it, then I think there's something to be said there. So, Monty, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank great. Thanks so for joining. Yeah. No, it's been really nice to, to be here and you know, keep up the great work you're doing as well. Thank, Thank you so much. Cheers, mate. I really hope you enjoyed today's Warrior Academy podcast episode. We're going to keep creating these episodes because I know that so many parents find them useful or get insights or get ideas about how to develop their child's character. But it all comes down to the three C's, confidence, conduct, and concentration. So if you want to get a deep insight into the levels of confidence your child has, the level of concentration they have, or the level of conduct they have, so that you can actually put a score next to it, and then work towards increasing those scores like we do in the Warrior Academy, then I'd love to invite you to fill in the breakthrough area assessment. It takes about five minutes of your time and you will get a personalized PDF report on your child's three C's. To access the breakthrough area assessment and find out your child's three C score, all you need to do is go to www.breakthrougharea.com.